Well, if we're going to cover almost 5 billion years of Earth's history, I'm going to have to go very fast, right? So let's start with the Precambrian, which began with the formation of our solar system 4.5 billion years ago and ended with an extinction and an explosion of life. Uh, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. We know this from radiometric dating of meteorites from Meteor Crater, Arizona. The oldest rock that we have so far counted found is on the east side of Hudson Bay, and it is a metamorphosed volcanic rock. The oldest fossils we have found are photosynthetic, which means they can produce a little bit of oxygen. That's from three and a half billion years ago. Uh, we believe that we had our oceans 3.8 billion years ago, but that the atmosphere did not get very much oxygen until a little more than 2 billion years ago. We think that modern plate tectonics began a little more than 3 billion years ago. I don't have a construction from that time. It's hard enough for me to understand the constructions from even 1 billion years ago, but I think I can recognize Europe right here. Occasionally, I'm going to talk a little bit about, focus a little bit on what was going on in the Pacific Northwest. Basically, the western edge of North America was at Hell's Canyon, and off to the west of us was another plate, which is now Siberia. Uh, the rocks that were deposited in, in the sea, just west of, uh, in, in western Montana and Idaho, are, are called the Belt Supergroup. And the closest example is Steptoe Butte, and another example is Chief Mountain, or actually many of the rocks in, in Glacier National Park. So again, they're about 1.4 billion years old. And you can actually collect these rocks if you know where to go in Walla Walla County. There were two ice ages. Later, I'm going to talk about the difference between an ice age and a glaciation, but there were two ice ages in the Precambrian. Uh, one of them was fairly early, about 2.2 billion years ago, and the record of that is up in Canada. And another one was pretty close to the end of the Precambrian, and records of that one are, for example, in Virginia. I'm fortunate to have samples from rocks deposited during both of those glaciations. Uh, during the second of those two Precambrian glaciations, we believe that glaciers reached all the way to the equator, hence the term snowball earth. I'm going to use only a very few phrases this uh, talk that you may not have heard of. One is the term mass extinction, and this means that more than half the Earth's species go extinct. So it turns out that there's a relatively newly discovered mass extinction from the end of the Precambrian. The, the fauna, the critters that lived then, are called Ediacaran, and they only had soft bodies, so they're very rare to find. All we can find is impressions of them. They didn't have any hard parts, so they're not very well preserved. We believe that, uh, I'm going to use the term anoxia several times, uh, diminished oxygen, which incidentally is ha happening in the ocean, world's oceans today. Uh, but it got so low that there was perhaps 80% loss of these critters in the late Precambrian. So that gets us through 4 billion years of Earth history, and the rest of the Earth's history is divided into the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. The Paleozoic lasted from the end of the Precambrian until about 250 million years ago, and here's a cute picture that I found uh, showing the critters that were living in the Paleozoic. The very beginning of the Paleozoic, we had an explosion of life. If you think of all the many phyla of, of animals that are on Earth today, most of these had their earliest beginnings in the Cambrian. Uh, on the left is my brother collecting trilobite fossils. That, there's a picture of a trilobite there up in the Burgess Shale in, on the crest of the Canadian Rockies. In the Paleozoic, there were two ice ages. One of them, which may have been pretty short and not very extensive, was in the Ordovician and the Silurian. We find that record in the Sahara Desert, which was a really big, when you think, big deal when you think of the contrast between the Sahara Desert today and it's having an ice age 400 million years or so ago. The second one was near the end of the Carboniferous Permian, and this map shows 
uh, the location of that ice age. Basically, this is, this is one of the take home messages from today. In order to get an ice age, a long period with alternating glaciations and interglaciations, we have to have enough continental mass near one of the poles. So this uh, subcontinent called Gondwana was sitting right on the South Pole uh, near the end of the Paleozoic. And these portions of those continents, which we find in different places today, uh, were glaciated. There were three mass extinctions in the Paleozoic, and you can read this faster than I can talk. So one of them was in the late Ordovician, which was sort of more or less at the time of that uh, glaciation I mentioned in the Ordovician. This was a really big one with 85% of species lost. Uh, we often wonder when there's a mass extinction whether heat was the major factor or cooling was the major factor, and I'll try to come back to that in a few minutes. Then there was Another mass extinction at the end of the Devonian, which is sometimes called the Age of Fish. And there was a third mass extinction exactly at the end of the Paleozoic. We had 90 to 96% of species becoming dead. And there, was, there were massive volcanic eruptions, what we call a large igneous province, the youngest of which is the Columbia Plateau, but perhaps the largest ever Called, was occurred in Siberia, and they're called the Siberian traps or the Siberian basalts. When we have this massive volcanism, we put out lots and lots of carbon dioxide, which you would think would warm things, but we also put out tremendous amounts of particulates, which can, the, the clouds can shield the sun from the earth. We also get trees burning, which can put a lot of ash in the atmosphere. So, uh, for this particular extinction, people favor warming, but for some of the others, they favor cooling. And in most cases, there is acidification, which is also occurring in today's oceans. The, the ocean has become approximately 30% more acid in the last century. That's today. So now we'll go on to the Mesozoic, the age of reptiles, which lasted from that catastrophe at the end of the Paleozoic to a catastrophe that happened exactly 66.043 million years ago. We know ex that's like plus or minus a few thousand years. It's amazing. So uh, before I get into the end of the Mesozoic, let's switch to the Northwest now. Everything that you see here in yellow was not originally part of North America. Most of Alaska came from somewhere else. Western California, Oregon, and Washington came from somewhere else. In many cases, those rocks have paleo latitudes, which we can measure with paleomagnetism, of 15 degrees latitude. In other words, way far south than we are. And also, many of those rocks have fossils that are kin to the fossils in Asia. So they came from very far to the west. This little diagram here, which I'll probably put up more than once, is supposed to show that most of the rocks in the Pacific Northwest come from here to here, and that these older rocks are we find in other places like the Rockies and the Appalachians and elsewhere on Earth. So if we, if we draw a cross-section of the Pacific Northwest, here's that boundary that I talked about, which was at Hell's Canyon, that was the western edge of Idaho. This is ancient North America. Those are those belt rocks like we found it, find at Steptoe Butte that are deposited on the edge. Everything west of this line right here has been accreted to North America. We call them accreted terrains. And as these things come in one at a time, there are actually many more than this, one, two, three, and the modern floor of the Pacific Ocean going down here. As they come in, the combination of water and the sediments at the top of the seafloor, plus the basalts of the seafloor themselves as they go down, eventually they cause melting. And these bodies, often of granite, come up, and we call that stitching, the plu stitching plutons. So these are plutonic rocks because they didn't reach the surface of the Earth, like Pluto is the god of the underworld, as opposed to volcanic rocks, which is when the magma makes it all the way to the surface, as in our modern high cascades, which are all less than one million years old. 
but there were earlier cascades, and here's an example of that. And then the other thing you want to remember is that when plates are colliding, there's going to be another picture of this in a few minutes. There's not only a lot of volcanism and igneous activity above where the subducted plate gets warm enough to make magma, but there's also a lot of compression going on right where the two plates meet. And so we typically get mountain ranges like the Oregon Coast Range and the Olympics. So we get two sets of mountains. This is, this is really typical around the Earth where plates collide. So here's a specific example from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, here are some of these rocks that probably came from southeastern Asia, a limestone that used to be a coral reef. And then they were intruded by this granite, one of those plutons, which is right here. At that time, a mountain range was created. That mountain range got eroded almost all the way down to sea level, where it was overwhelmed by the much later Columbia River basalts, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And a second mountain range has been developed so that the rocks that we find under Joseph, Oregon at 4,000 feet of elevation are on top of the, of the Wallawas at over 9,000 feet of elevation. So two really important mount building episodes in the Pacific Northwest. In the Mesozoic, we had two mass extinctions. One was at the end of the Triassic. Only 70 to 75% of species become extinction. This is another one where we think warming may have been more important. Uh, and, but again, we had acidification of the world's oceans. And then we had this phenomenal event with 75% of the species dying in days or weeks. It was just absolutely amazing. When I was in graduate school, one of the leading hypotheses for this mass extinction was the eruption of the Deccan basalts in the Ghat Mountains of India, which is another large igneous event with many hundreds or thousands of cubic kilometers of basalt coming out in less than a million years. But then the Alvarez brothers discovered uh, an, an anomaly uh, a, a rare element uh, in, in, in rocks at this boundary. And so for decades, there was a long debate about which was more important, the volcanism in India or the asteroid or bolide or meteor that hit the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. A lot of people, including myself, now think that the Deccan basalts made things really tough for critters to live, and then the asteroid finished them off. A fairly recent discovery is that when this asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula, which was a place with shallow water at the time, 65 million years ago, it sent a tsunami around the world. I thought I was misreading this at 4.5 meters high. It was 4.5 kilometers high. This tsunami was as deep as many parts of the ocean are. So that would kill a few things. So we then get into Cenozoic, which begins with this big bang with this asteroid hitting uh, the eastern edge of Mexico. And as I said before, we think in this particular time it was probably ash from forest fires and from volcanic ash. Returning to the Pacific Northwest, that's, here's a sort of a plate tectonic map. Uh, this is the floor of the Pacific Ocean here. There's a relatively small tectonic plate called the Juan de Fuca Plate. It is growing at these spreading ridges like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So these things are going apart right there. And then they're coming together. The Juan de Fuca Plate, as shown in an earlier cross-section and in the next cross-section, is diving down between North America. A fairly important factor is that earlier plate tectonics had made some big major mountain ranges, the Klamaths and all the mountains of northeastern Oregon, like the, uh, like the Wallawas, a whole bunch of old rocks in the North Cascades and the San Juan Islands. And there was this big area here which was relatively shallow. Uh, at times there was some seawater in there, but there was mainly just a lot of fresh water. This whole area called the Columbia Embayment during the Cenozoic filled up with volcanics, both the Columbia River basalts, which are here, the ancestral and high cascades, and then, it, and then some uh, volcanic rocks that got subducted in, like in the Olympic Mountains, and also a tremendous amount of sediment shed 
from the surrounding mountains. Oh, here's that other cross section. I think you've got the idea. Here's the spreading ridge at the Juan de Fuca plate, uh, at the Juan de Fuca ridge, the Juan de Fuca plate going down, melting occurring, magma coming up to make cascade volcanoes, and these mountains due to the compression between North America and the subducting plate. This is one of my very favorite pictures. This, uh, the, the idea for this was uh, developed by a colleague of mine who uh, got his PhD at Oregon State. He was a guy that figured out, in particular, this track right here. So there are these features called mantle plumes or hot spots. One is in Hawaii. As you go southeast across the Hawaiian Islands, they get younger and younger. That's because the Pacific plate is moving to the northwest, as you see right here. On the other hand, we have, and that's an ocean hot spot or mantle plume. We also have a continental hot spot or plume, which is at Yellowstone National Park, where there have been three absolutely huge eruptions in the last two and a half million years. Well, this all began at McDermott Caldera in northern Nevada. And the volcanism went out in multiple directions. This became what's called the Monument Dyke Swarm. This is a line of volcanics that Mike Denny and I took people to uh, a few months ago, uh, going, for example, from Burns Butte to Newberry Caldera. This is, this is uh, another path that some of the volcanism took, a third one going to the south. And this one is really important for us in Walla Walla. This is what erupted the Miocene-Columbia River basalts, starting at Steens Mountain in southeastern Oregon and coming all the way up to southeastern Washington. These yellow-green things are dikes. They're fissures. I'll show a picture of one in a few minutes where the magma was coming up through pre-existing rocks. And then this is the hot spot track that goes from McDermott Caldera to Hawaii Caldera to the Jarbage Bruno Caldera, a whole series of calderas across the Snake River Plain and that hot spot is currently at Yellowstone. OK, so I mentioned before four ice ages. The last ice age, in terms of worldwide coverage, began two million years ago. One of the things that initiated it was Antarctica moving to the South Pole. I said how important it is to have continents near a pole in order to get an ice age. So it was actually glaciated starting 35 million years ago. And Greenland started about 3 million years ago. So this, that's this particular last of five ice ages up there. What is melting today? I'm going to cover these subjects uh, one at a time with not much spent time spent on sea ice, because when sea ice melts, it's floating. And so sea level doesn't go up at all. But the melting of sea ice, like many other factors going on today, has a very strong positive feedback. As the color of the Arctic changes from white sea ice to blue ocean, a lot more energy is absorbed. And that's the main reason why the Arctic today is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world. The other things that are melting are permafrost. As it melts, the organic matter in it near the surface liberates carbon dioxide, and the organic matter at it down deep, where there isn't much oxygen, liberates methane, which, as you know, is 20 or 30 times as powerful per molecule as carbon dioxide. And of course, glaciers and snowfields <clears throat> are melting. So what about permafrost? Considering the damage to buildings that are occurring where permafrost is melting, it's very important to know that the term permafrost is independent of moisture content. But specifically, if the ground has a lot of ice in it and it melts, it's going to subside a lot. But if it doesn't have very much ice in it and it melts, it's not going to subside very much at all. So where we're getting is differential subsidence. If it was uniform, the buildings would just sink. They wouldn't break. But they're breaking. And the temperature has to be below freezing. We refer to the area with permafrost as the periglacial, almost glacial. It's plenty cold like glaciation, but it's too dry to get glaciers. So this is a picture in the Yukon of 
Claire's ice axe, which I left, Claire's rock hammer, which I left behind, and she's never forgiven me. And, and this is about a half a meter of organic matter in the middle of the summer. It has thawed. That's called the active layer. It's in yellow. Then here's the permafrost right there. <clears throat> and it can be 2,000 feet deep. And there's a place where the Earth's temperature is warm enough so there's no permafrost down there. So the area, uh, you, you can also read this faster than I can talk. So everywhere that's in purple has uh, lots of permafrost. The, sh the, the dark purple means everywhere. As you get down to the lighter colors, it means sporadic permafrost, uh, depending, for example, on whether it's a north-facing or south-facing slope. <clears throat> uh, there are some cities that are far north that are having a lot of problems. I'll show some pictures. These emissions of carbon dioxide and methane from the melting of permafrost are responsible for very, very roughly 10% of global warming. <clears throat> when permafrost melts, the ground sinks to differing degrees, and we call that thermokarst. Karst is a term from places where there are caverns and the ground sinks. So thermokarst is characterized, as I said before, by the thawing of permafrost. And because the ice distribution is not uniform, we get differential subsidence. So there's one example right there in Finland. Here's a more dramatic example from Alaska, where the truck is. There was lots of ice in the permafrost. And here is an example from the from Siberia of buildings cracking due to, dif due to differential subsidence. The place where melting permafrost is perhaps the most serious, at least to the people that live there, is the edges of the ocean, for example, all of northern Alaska. When there was sea ice here, there weren't waves. When the sea ice broke up, there were uh, icebergs. The waves take the icebergs and batter them against the shore. The shore erodes and exposes the permafrost, and so the land just sinks, so much so that some Native American villages have, have, to have, been, have to be removed a mile or two inland. OK, so that's a very quick summary of the problems associated with permafrost. Let's go on to glaciation. I've already said that there were only five age, ice ages. They last millions of years. And within each, and I've told you that it's dependent on where the continents are. Within each ice age, there are alternating glaciations and interglaciations on very, very approximately a 50 or 100,000 year cycle. So in Earth history, we've had five ice ages. We've had hundreds of glaciations with interglaciations between them. I'm going to show this later for a specific reason, but right now I just want to show you the last million years of Earth history going from older to younger. This is the peak of the next to last glaciation about 140,000 years ago. When it's down, it means sea level is down. A lot of the Earth is covered with ice, and temperature is roughly 6 degrees Celsius cooler. And so this is that last glaciation coming on, peaking about 20,000 years ago. Another thing to notice is that glaciers build up on the land slowly and retreat very quickly. We go from, from, from 20,000 years to 11,000 years ago in a very, very short period of time. As I said, I'll come back to that later. The reason for alternating glaciations and interglaciations is Earth-Sun geometry. And uh, just quickly, uh, the Earth's axis wobbles it, it, by a few degrees on a cycle of 41,000 years. The fact that the Earth's orbit is not a circle has a period, this oval, of 100,000 years. The precession of the equinox is kind of hard to explain, but it's when in the northern hemisphere during the summer versus winter, when are we closest to the sun? It turns out that a really critical latitude is mid-Canada and mid-Scandinavia. Exactly how much sunlight falls there based on the changes in these three parameters. And notice that very, very roughly, these parameters are multiples of each other. So they can reinforce each other. So if in central Canada, enough snow builds up in the summer, 
to persist and then more falls on it in the next summer, then we may get a glacier. The glaciers that started in Labrador advance all the way to Alberta. So I've said some of this already, but uh, in the last uh, two million years during a glaciation, the earth has been 30% covered as opposed to 10% today. Sea level has been 125 meters or 400 feet down compared to today. And the temperature was six degrees colder compared to today. These are pretty drastic changes, but it takes much less temperature change than that to have a very serious effect on weather and climate and critters. Let's take one example from near the peak of the last glaciation, just after the peak of the last glaciation. I love this particular slide because it illustrates hopefully most of the things that are showing right here. So we had a large ice sheet which started in Labrador and came all the way to Alberta. Another ice sheet that grew in British Columbia. The two hit each other in Alberta. This ice came down into northeastern Washington in the Puget Lowland. We also had alpine glaciers in the Cascades, the Sierra Nevada, and scattered throughout the Rockies. We had an ice dam up here at the Idaho-Montana border forming Glacial Lake Missoula, and another ice dam here at Grand Coulee Dam forming Glacial Lake Columbia. As you are very much aware, this ice dam broke. The water partly poured into this lake and partly went down to Palouse Falls. All the water came together at Wallula Gap and out to a lower Pacific Ocean. That happened hundreds of times in geologic history, not just during the last glaciation, but during earlier glaciations. But only once in all of history that we know of did a giant lake form that covered one third of the state of Utah. And it was because a river from Bear Lake, which is roughly right here, had been going into the Snake River, but it got diverted by lava flows, and all of a sudden it went to where the Great Salt Lake is today. Those lava flows were about 50,000 years ago, and the next peak of the glaciation was 20,000 years ago, so that all this extra water from the Bear River going into the Bonneville Basin, we get this tremendous lake that's 1,000 feet deep. It rose and rose and rose and overflowed at Red Rock Pass and sent a single flood down the Snake River, down Hell's Canyon, and we find the last evidence for it at Lewiston, buried under later floods from Glacial Lake Missoula. Well, this wasn't the only lake. There were lakes throughout the Southwest that when it was cooler and moister, filled up. And, and they're like Christmas Valley in Oregon, and they're uh, Lake Lahontan in Nevada. They were all over the place. And we call these pluvial lakes, P-L-U-V-I-A-L. In general, the highest levels of pluvial lakes were during the peaks of glaciation. And since the last flood was very, very roughly 14,000 years ago, and since the earliest evidence of humans at, in the Pacific Northwest, like at Fort Rock in southeastern Oregon, is about 14,000 years ago, I asked the question, did any early Native Americans witness any Missoula floods? As sea level went down uh, from, let's say, 30 to 15,000 years or so ago, this was all dry land right here. And we're unsure what the climate was like. In many cases, we say it was like northern Alaska today, but there is a theory that's saying that it was actually much milder at that time. And I don't know the answer to that. The original idea was that these people who migrated from Mongolia and Siberia came down into Alaska and the Yukon, and then as this ice was retreating back to Labrador and as this ice was retreating back into the Rockies, there was an ice-free corridor. But that ice-free corridor probably didn't open up until 13,000 years or so ago, and we think that humans got here before that. So the current leading theory is that humans waited until the ice retreated a little bit from coastal Alaska and western British Columbia and the Olympic Peninsula and came down this way. These dates aren't exactly accurate. They change all the time. There have been new discoveries in Mexico that possibly push the origin of, of Native Americans back to 38,000 years ago. This number still pretty much stands, although there's one exception at a place in Chile. We are sure that at least 
by 10,000 years ago, Native Americans had gotten all the way to Tierra del Fuego. We know that at this time, at roughly 13, 12, 11,000 years ago, that 35 large mammal genera, like mastodons, mammoths, woolly rhinos, and their carnivores like cave bears and, and uh, saber-toothed tigers and things like that became extinct. Why? Huge debates. They've been going on for 40 years. No, 50 years. Anyhow, one theory by Paul Martin at the University of Arizona was that humans did it. They encountered these animals that had never seen people before. They were easily slaughtered. The population was growing. And as the animals died off, the humans just went south and found more animals. Another theory is climate change because the climate was dramatically shifting as we get to the end of the last glaciation. But the biggest hole in that argument is the climate changed radically at the end of each glaciation, of dozens of glaciations. So why, if it was only climate, didn't some of these extinctions occur earlier? Now, there's something that so far we really can't analyze, but maybe as we do DNA on some of these frozen mammoths that come out of permafrost, maybe we'll de determine th that there was another factor. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about, more about glaciers. There are many ways to classify them, but stagnant glaciers aren't moving anymore because they're too thin or the slope is too gentle. And then of the glaciers that are moving relatively slowly, let's say a foot a day, some are called polar or cold base and they are frozen to their bed. So they can only flow and because they're cold, that flow rate, they're so viscous that they don't flow very fast but they're not sliding at all. But temperate or warm-based glaciers have water at their base and they not only flow and faster than polar glaciers because they are warmer and less viscous, but also they slide. This is a picture that I was very fortunate to get when I was climbing Mount Kenya with students. We, we discovered the base of the Lewis Glacier. You probably all know about striations on rocks, striated rocks. When a glacier drags rocks over bedrock, it puts striations in it with very fine, fine lines on the surface. But the irregularities of the bedrock also groove the base of the glacier. And that proves that this glacier is not frozen to its bed, that it's actually sliding towards us over it. So again, we have two of those types of glaciers. And we also have surging glaciers, which move at phenomenal rates, like many kilometers in a year. Another important factor about glaciers, and this is getting to the essence of why we're losing our glaciers today, sort of like a bank account, if the accumulation by snowfall, avalanches, etc., cetera, exists, uh, surpasses the loss by melting and, uh, and sublimation, then the margin advances. Not only is the margin advancing, the glacier's getting thicker and it's getting longer. Whereas, if the accumulation is less than the ablation, the margin retreats. When we say that, we really mean that the glacier's getting thinner and shorter. So when we say that a glacier is retreating, we don't mean it's defying gravity and moving up the hill. We just mean it's getting smaller and thinner, okay? But an important a uh, phenomena for geologists studying what happened when is when the accumulation is equal to the ablation. The glacier is in equilibrium. It stays the same thickness, the same size. That glacier acts as a conveyor belt and all the sediment that it's, getting, that it's transporting accumulates right at the edge for a long period of time. And that builds what's called a moraine. If we can date the moraine, then we know when the glacier was where. Uh, I was fortunate, oh, that's supposed to say rain up there. Uh, there is meltwater on polar glaciers and there is rain on Greenland summit. This was reported uh, just last June. When students and I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro way back in 2001, as we walked across the summit, there was not a drop of water anywhere. None of the volcanic rocks were wet right at the edge of the glacier. The only thing that was happening up there was sublimation. Now the glaciers on the summit of Kilimanjaro are melting because it's warmer. 
So it's, they're not only losing mass by sublimation, they're also losing mass by melting. I'm going to have a graph in a few minutes uh, showing the causes of sea level rise, but the number one factor is the Greenland ice sheet. So this is called the equilibrium line. Above that line, there's net accumulation. So if the glacier wasn't flowing, it would get higher and higher. And below it, there's net ablation. So the surface is getting lower. This boundary, which in 2014, which in southern Greenland was at an elevation of 1,840 meters, which is roughly there, is going up. The top of the Greenland ice sheet is going down due to loss. And the equilibrium line is going up. When that equilibrium line gets, goes up and as the top of the glacier comes down, when they cross, granted, is, Greenland's going to go, it's just going to disappear. And it will never come back. And I'll, I'll come back to that more later. And how much will sea level go up? Where are we? Oh, first of all, these are some pictures of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. These meltwater ponds only have developed in the last few decades. There are rivers of water on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet that are pouring down into moulins and they're getting at the bottom of the glacier, which is going to help the glacier to move faster, which means its elevation is going to go down as ice flows towards the surrounding oceans. Claire said, Bob, don't depress them too much. Okay. So, uh, as I said, the number one factor is Greenland. And if Greenland goes away, we're talking about 24 feet of sea level rise. We're going to lose most of our mountain glaciers, but they're so small uh, that it's only going to raise sea level one or two feet. There's a hypothesis that the West Antarctic, Antarctic ice sheet may surge into the ocean. It's unstable, we know. That would raise sea level by 20 feet. And at least at present, the East Antarctic ice sheet, which has the greatest mass, is more or less stable. So we could be talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 feet of sea level rise in the next few hundred years. Uh, we're not going to get to 260, probably. This is a little bit scary down here. Uh, if we reach no emissions of CO2 combined with pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. Sea level is only going to go up about a meter, which is bad news for most of the world's coastal cities and most of Florida and Bangladesh, et cetera. That's highly unlikely. Uh, this we can pray for, that sea level only goes up one and a half meters, but it could be much worse than that. OK, now I promised that I would show f several graphs of temperature versus, uh, versus time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show uh, a diagram that is one-fifth and one-tenth as long as I go through these four. So here we are for all of the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And we see these really broad changes in temperature as, as we go through the ages and have, have these four ice ages, uh, including the present one. Uh, and then, so that's 500 million years. Here we go with 50 million years. So this is basically the Cenozoic. And we see that overall, during the Cenozoic, the Earth's climate was cooling. And we reached a threshold about right in here, where we started getting the last ice age. Now, if we go down by another factor of 5 or 10, here we are for the last 5 million years. We crossed, we crossed a threshold right about in here where all of a sudden Greenland got glaciated and then Scandinavia and Canada got glaciated. These are those, these changes due to Earth-Sun geometry. And here we are for the last glaciation. Now we go down to merely 450,000 years ago. We have the last, make sure I get this right, we've got the, uh, this is the last glaciation here. These, these things reverse. So there's the last glaciation, the next four. So we've got four glaciations. And there we are down to 
uh, a few thousand years ago, but the last one is the one that's most important. This is the end of the last glaciation at 11,000 years ago. There, there are many ways to define that. One way is when the glaciers cross from the United States to Canada. Then we have a period called the Altithermal, or the period of maximum warmth and dryness. And then, believe it or not, we actually started another glaciation about 4,000 years ago. The earlier parts of it at 4,000 and 2,000 years ago are called neoglaciation. And then we have this misnomer called the Little Ice Age, which was from about 1300 to 1850. This line here is very far hard to see because it's so close to today, and it's going up. That's what's happened since 1850. We have killed what would have been the next glaciation. Humans have done that. And because, I'll probably say this again in a few minutes, because it's going to be at least 250 million years before any continents move toward the poles, we've had the end of the Ice Age, which has lasted 2 million years. So I now I'm almost done. I have three graphs for you. And you can read them much faster than I can talk. So I just want you to think of all the different ways why we're having global warming. It's not just the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, I could mention a few. Cement production, 8%, because we use fossil fuels to heat limestone to make carbon dioxide. So it's, it's a double whammy around the Earth's atmosphere. Black carbon and colored micro, microplastics are found everywhere on Earth from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of the ocean. And when they land on snow and ice, they make it melt quickly. And when it's in the sky, it, it traps radiation from going away from our atmosphere. So many, many, many ways. Extinction of beavers. Each beaver pond traps sediment and organics, which are full of carbon and reduces floods, et cetera. So that's just a long list of why we're getting global climate change. This is a question I love to ask people. Is warming the only problem associated with global climate change? And you all know that there are many other problems. So here's my short list. The ones that are in red are causing uh, positive feedback. So as the atmosphere warms, it can hold more moisture, and it can rain more, and it can melt more snow, uh, and the higher temperatures cause more evaporation, which makes it hotter yet. So that, that's another example. Dramatic one, which I already melting, mentioned, is the melting of sea ice, causing this very dramatic warming at high latitudes. So. Today, we are undergoing what many people call the sixth mass extinction. You've all heard about how fewer birds there are. You've all heard about extinctions of mammals. This is some of the data. And then there are some predictions here, which are scary. Uh, I don't know which one's worse, the loss of coral reefs. So we have that late Precambrian mass extinction, which is the newcomer in terms of the scientific literature. And then, then we have what were called the Big Five, uh, with this last one right here at the Mesozoic Cenozoic boundary when the meteor hit uh, Mexico. And then we, if we look at rate of extinction, it's getting pretty daggone high compared to some of these mass extinctions. So will we lose 50% of all species? Will it be a mass extinction? And then finally, there's this phenomenal book that came out, and lots of people have written about this. What can we do to reduce global climate change? This book that was edited by Paul Hawken lists 100 different ways in which we can reduce climate change, and none of them are stop burning fossil fuels. None of them are negatives. They are all positives. They all reduce global warming. They also have many other effects. I mean, things like educating girls. And they have, this book has numbers in it, OK? How many gigatons of carbon are we going to get out of the atmosphere or stop putting into the atmosphere? 
It has the things that you all know about, and some of these you might want to debate, like nuclear or something like that, but wind turbines are big, solar is big. A lot of these things right here have to do with agriculture. Agriculture and what we specifically eat probably account for about 30% of global climate change. So we have known since 1800 that humans were causing global climate change. As I said before, this climate change has stopped a glaciation that began 4,000 years ago, ended it, and make the glaciation that ended 11,000 years ago the last one in 2 million years of Earth's history in the last ice age. As I said before, it's going to be a long, long time. And actually, we don't know when, but the plate tectonic predictions for the next 250 million years do not show continents moving poleward. Thank you very much. I'll take questions. I welcome challenges. Mike Denny. So I have a friend that did a fair amount of construction in Magadan, Russia. And he keeps in contact with people that live there. And he has been told that most of the buildings that he put in there have cracked and are now unusable because he built them in the mid to late 1970s. And the permafrost has melted so uh, deep that the ground now has uh, changed its form on the surface. And he was astounded because some of the footings they put in went right to the permafrost. They couldn't go much deeper. And he said there was no rocks there. That it's just going to the permafrost and that was your fate. But he said uh, the amount of destruction in Magadan city of 150,000 people. It was once a gulag. Uh, it's just devastating. And uh, Russians do not know what to do. They don't have anywhere to take these people and place them elsewhere. And so he said that they are trying to figure out how to do floating buildings that will go with the melt and the reformation Thank you for that specific example. And make, independent of whatever pilings they're putting down, make, make the, I'll just call it the foundation above the pilings, make that stronger. Mike Denny and I are ramrodding a course uh, to be offered at Community College from roughly mid-January, sorry, mid-February to mid-March called Dams and Salmon. And if you want to take it, it's not going to be very expensive. You'd be able to register sometime in, in December by contacting the Community College. Yes, Keith? When you think about the quantification of those last few slides, um, it almost seems hopeless. Um, could you comment on that? When, when COVID hit, most countries on earth, or many countries on earth, had a really drastic reaction and really did something, whether it was masks or shots, masks or shots. But COVID came on so fast, it was really scary. I, th I think one of the problems with global climate change is that it's slow. Uh, in terms of Earth's history, it's very, very fast. 
But, you know, so sea level went up another tenth of an inch, or, uh, hey, we got another flood in Bangladesh, or another forest fire in California. You'd think that this past year would have been enough, but you've got, you've got very serious political problems. Uh, you have, we have a very divided nation, uh, and many other countries are divided too, and they're, uh, a lot of the poorer countries uh, have to balance uh, getting electricity to people that don't have it and how they're going to do that versus climate change. And to get electricity to somebody, even if it's from a coal-fired power plant that the Chinese are still building, is an instant thing that is successful. Whereas climate change is just so incremental. It's, uh, I think you could tell that I'm pretty sure most of these things are going to happen and are happening. It's not a future thing. It's now, and it's going to get worse. I don't know if I answered your question. I mean, last night, Chris Howard and I went to the city council and asked the city to ban gas-operated leaf blowers. Operating a gas-operated leaf blower for one hour creates as much pollution as driving a new car 1,100 miles. What was the reaction? Oh, it, was, it was quiet. I mean, the City Sustainability Committee has already sent a proposal to the city council asking them to study the problem, phase them out, or do something. But uh, to the best of our knowledge, they've done nothing yet, and they got it six months ago. I mean, they, they have a lot of other priorities, to be fair. Yes, Groover. Very much so. So uh, afforestation, for example, along the Yarlung Sangpo River in Tibet, they've taken an area that never had trees, and they've planted trees there. And they're causing shade, so the river is cooler. They're providing firewood. Uh, they're providing habitat, et cetera. Uh, uh, No-till farming. When you till the ground, it brings the carbon up, and it and it, goes, it, it decays to carbon dioxide. If you don't till the ground, the carbon stays down, it sequesters more moisture, it provides more nutrients, it reduces erosion. So that's what I meant when I said that some of the things that we can do, I mentioned in particular educating girls, are more than just a climate change things, they're better for the earth in many ways. Uh, we now use tremendous amounts of, uh, I'll call it, uh, fossil fuel-based fertilizers. If we could start using more fertilizer, like cow manure, things would be better. There, there's so many things that are going on, like you can feed cattle seaweed and they won't belch out as much sea, uh, methane as they do. They're just, that's why I said 30% of what we eat and how we farm is all of global warming. We have a tendency to think of it all being fossil fuels, but it isn't. Okay, I will stick around. One more uh, thing to ask you to consider. The bookstore has the Wallula Gap, the Walla Walla Valley, and the Blue Mountains uh, books for sale. And if you already have them, you could buy them as Christmas present for somebody else. And, <laughs> and, and that will support the Fort Walla Walla Museum. Uh, thank you very much for coming and for your interest. I'll, I'll sign books and I'll stick around to ask any questions that you might have.